Yes, it is. It may actually have cut the spread of the virus by 50% or more. Tonight's live guest is Dr. Dean Seidlinger with the Oregon Health Authority. He joins us now. He works to, uh, on projections and keeping track of cases and the uh, numbers that we're seeing in Oregon right now. When I say that that number, that the social distancing is working by cutting it to 50%, can you explain exactly what that means and what people should take from that? Well, I think, you know, we've been looking at the sacrifices that we're making. You know, we know they've been tough and, and are they working? And so we work with modelers from the Institute for Disease uh, Modeling and their projections show that if we keep doing what we're doing, if Oregonians keep staying home um, to save lives, that our, our disease um, spread here in Oregon is cut by a half. And so if we can keep that up, we can keep the numbers manageable here in Oregon. And we know that that way people who need care can get the care they need and receive the quality care they need. So people need to kind of keep it up and, and find ways to stay busy at home. Now, keeping it up has been a massive sacrifice for a lot of people, people out of work, things like that, as you, you're uh, well aware of. Um, if we were to stop tomorrow, of course, that number would be expected to spike again, correct? Am I right in saying that? Right. When we put these measures in place, it takes, you know, anywhere from one to three weeks to see the full effects. Um, so if we ease these up right now, we would expect a fairly significant increase in cases over the next couple of weeks. That could very quickly get out of control and could result in situations where people are seeking care and having trouble getting that care. Um, we know that right now, personal protective equipment amongst our healthcare providers is stretched thin. We're trying to get more of that into the system. And so we need to make sure that we're able to build that up and have the healthcare system there to care for the people who need it and the stay home to save lives is really helping us do that right now. So to me, as I think of it in, in those terms, what we're doing right now is just helping us to get by. So what is the timeline for this? Because outside of a, a vaccine, anytime we would break this kind of protocol we're all living under right now, we would see a spike. So what is the timeline for, for this life that we're all living? You're correct that right now everyone is susceptible. This virus can, um, male, female, young, old, everyone can get it. And so until we have that vaccine, which is a year or two away, um, the best thing we can do right now is to stay home um, and stay safe. Um, we know that um, if we can do that, get past this potential peak, put some situations in place where there's more testing available in the community, um, that those results are available rapidly, that we have the workforce and the services people need to stay home while they recover, that then we can make sure that people who are ill with COVID-19 could stay home, that we can monitor them, um, that we can keep the disease under control until we have another way to control the disease, the vaccine or a medication that can treat people when they get sick. So right now we're in this, not just for the short period, but probably for a you know, the next several weeks, two months or more. Um, and we'll continue to look at the projections, see how the disease is spreading in our community and make recommendations and work with our policymakers to assure that we're doing the things that are keeping Oregon safe and healthy now. And that there are other things in place that are helping to deal with the devastating economic effects we're seeing. Because as you said, we know that this has had um, severe effects. People have lost their jobs, small and large businesses are struggling. So we know it's a great sacrifice for people, but we do see early signs that that sacrifice is paying off and that we're keeping people healthy and, and we are saving people's lives. What can you tell us about the people who you have seen who, who have been sick, who have had this virus as far as the breakdown? Because um, you hear statistics from different countries, from different states in this country. When it comes to Oregon, how old are the people who you are seeing with this virus? Do you see the same type of numbers with older people having more severe symptoms? What's the breakdown, even when it comes to men and women and the people you're seeing with COVID-19 here in Oregon? Well, let me start with the symptom question first. You know, the vast majority of people who get COVID-19 who become sick with this virus um, have mild symptoms and they can recover at home. And so that continues to be what we see um, throughout Oregon and throughout other states. As for complications, um, folks with underlying medical condition, children or adults, that's respiratory disease, cardiac disease, um, diabetes, and older adults, those over 60, are more susceptible to complications. That doesn't mean we haven't seen younger adults and even children in the hospital. Um, but it just means that folks with those underlying conditions are more likely to get sick. If we look at the cases in Oregon, regardless of hospitalization, the vast majority have been in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. More than half the cases have been in that middle um, and older adult range. Um, and 
that is similar to what um, we've seen in other parts of the country. Dr. Seidlinger, thank you so much. I, I know how busy you've been because I've seen you on TV more than I'm on TV. So I know you're working really long hours and, and from everybody here in Oregon, I want to thank you for doing that and working for us to help answer all these questions. We appreciate your time. Thank you and thank you for helping us get the word out that the sacrifices people are making are working and, and hopefully as Oregonians we can keep it up and, and keep this strong, staying home to save lives so that we can get through this together. You got it. Thank you. So have you seen the claims that CBD products can treat COVID-19? Well, if you have, they're false, as you probably guess. A Portland store was just ordered to take down signs, actually. So if you see any of these false claims, what should you do? Dr. Sally Greenberg of the National Consumers League has the answer. They should report it to their state attorney general's office. Every attorney general office, every state has a uh, Department of Consumer Protection. So put in Consumer Protection, State of Oregon. By the way, the, uh, the, the attorney general in Oregon just issued a really good uh, warning to fake CBD claims on COVID. So we need, we need the state actors, to, to, to the good guys, to do the right thing on the state level, but also the FDA is taking complaints, and we're very, uh, we're very appreciative of the federal agency, which is the gold standard for approving drugs. One last point: there is not one single uh, over-the-counter CBD product that's been approved by the FDA. There's thousands of them out there. Not one single one meets federal standards for a product that in, in has good manufacturing. Uh, uh, processes or has uh, has been vetted for safety, has been vetted for how effective it is. So consumers stay away from CBD and particularly stay away from anything that claims to treat or cure the COVID virus. A prison employee who works in the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem has coronavirus. That had a lot of you asking what is being done right now to keep both employees and inmates safe. We know that they closed all the facilities to visitors and they eliminated group activities. Here's a little more from the Chief of Medicine at the Oregon Department of Corrections. We developed a, a, a hygiene and education committee and we're going on to the units three times a week to instruct our AICs on how to wash their hands, making sure soap and water are available, um, asking them to cover their cough, instructing them on how to report illness to us. Um, and in our efforts, we are discussing the importance of social distancing. Okay, at any time, you can send your questions to the number you see on your screen right now, 503-226-5111. If we go, don't get to yours tonight, we'll be answering questions right here at 7 o'clock Monday through Thursday. Up next, you wanted to know if stores have to tell one of us, have to tell any of us, if an employee has been infected with the coronavirus. We're going to have that answer for you next. But first, a question from Steve in the Halem. He wants to know... Does loading up on vitamin C help prevent catching the virus? The answer is no. There is no evidence that taking vitamin C will help prevent infection from the coronavirus together. All right, welcome back. We've been getting a ton of questions from you about uh, the number of cases that we have here in Oregon right now of coronavirus. And if stores have to tell you if one of their workers gets infected, Kristen Severance has some answers. All right, we have gotten this question so many times that we wanted people to know we are working on it. This viewer wants to know what responsibility do stores have to inform the community when they have an employee who is infected? So we've checked with several agencies on this, from OSHA to the governor's office. Right now, it looks like there's no legal requirement to tell your customers if an employee has a COVID-19 diagnosis, but we will, of course, update that answer if we get more information. The next question is Goodwill still accepting donations? No. And I know a lot of people are doing cleaning right now. They have a bunch of things to donate, but Goodwill is not accepting items at this time. And our next question, Oregon appears to have fewer cases than many states. 
Is it a reflection of smaller population, fewer tests being conducted, or is it legitimately fewer cases? So the doctors we've been consulting with for many of these answers say maybe, but it's always better to look at statistics from the basis of per capita. Also, you have to know how many people have actually been tested. And at this point, we have no idea how many people in any state are infected because really we have only just begun testing and we still aren't doing it on the massive scale we need. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. We do our very best to answer them in every show and during our special coronavirus Q&A show every night at 7 o'clock. A lot of you also want to know if the coronavirus is even more contagious than what we originally thought. Dr. Ken Stedman, a biology professor at Portland State, takes that on for us. Great question. I think the answer is we don't completely know. Um, and you may have heard that the CDC which is a great source of information, by the way. Um, always worth going and look at cdc.gov. Um, they think that there may be a lot more asymptomatic transmission than we first knew about. Um, and those are people who are really not showing symptoms at all. Maybe they're just before they're going to show some symptoms that you're actually going to see something. But um, at, at that level, it doesn't seem to be really that much more contagious than we thought. I think the question is how much of uh, transmission is happening. And until we get more testing, and this is you know more numbers testing rather than that 5% I was talking about before, um, until we get more numbers, then it's going to be really hard for us to tell um, exactly how much transmission is taking place. And some of that transmission may be taking place, and we don't even know it. That brings us to the importance of social distancing. Many of you have been asking why social distancing is so important, why it can actually stop the spread of this. Chris Vanderveen has that answer. Bloop. See that? That's you. And you have the measles. And those, those dots around you, they have zero protection against the virus. Science tells us eventually you will infect upwards of 15 other dots, thanks to something known as an r naught. Yep, r naught, a fancy term that tells you how contagious a disease is. The r naught of measles, around 15. The r naught of smallpox, 6. Both are very contagious, but measles remains rare. And no one gets smallpox anymore. Credit the rise of vaccinations, an effective shield against contagion. Maybe a few dots received one, maybe that one didn't. But see what it does to the spread? Now let's take the new coronavirus. Its r naught of 2 or 3 suggests it's not as harmful. But as of now, no one has protection. There is no vaccine. So you and your dot could infect 2 or 3. And those 2 or 3 could infect 4 or 5. And so on and so on. In the U.S., the number of cases is doubling every three days, a true case of exponential growth. But let's say you decide to social distance and only infect one, not two or three. Your neighbor doesn't go to work. Your coworker doesn't hit the park. A stranger stays home. Infections can still happen, but the odds of any one dot infecting two or three others decreases thanks to distance. The contagion slows. Exponential growth turns into linear growth, if not this. Until there is an effective treatment or a vaccine, physical distancing represents the best dots, say infectious disease experts, one by one, connecting the dots by doing nothing more than Bureau Health. Hi, this health crisis is an extra thing to worry about for many expecting mothers out there. You wanted to know what to do from the hospital when you go in to give birth. Ashley Corslin found the answer for you. So it all depends on where you plan to deliver your baby. But for example, at Legacy Health, women are only allowed to have one support person in the delivery room and for the remainder of your stay. Um, you are encouraged to wear a mask during labor. Pay attention to the entrances of the hospital. There may be uh, limitations and closures on certain access points. So call ahead so you know where to arrive to. And this is a big one. Um, if you think you're going into labor, call before you go to the hospital. And here's why. If the hospital had a recent surge in coronavirus patients, there is a chance that you may be directed to go to a different hospital or different different facility to actually give birth. So just make sure you're prepared and open-minded about all the potential changes. All right, thank you to Ashley. And up next, we're all feeling a little something during this pandemic, right? We, we're answering some of your questions about what to do if you're feeling isolated or depressed. 
But first, a common question a lot of you have, you wanted to know where to go to take a test for COVID-19. The answer, your doctor has to order a test for you first and can then direct you to where to take it. And if you're wondering how much you're gonna get from that $2 trillion emergency stimulus bill Congress just passed, well, we've made that easy for you. Go ahead and text the word CHECK to 503-226-5111. We'll send you a link to a stimulus check calculator. We'll be There is a lot of uncertainty with this health crisis, of course, especially when it comes to the economy. You ask when restrictions are lifted, where does the country stand in terms of returning to where it once was? We consulted NBC financial correspondent Stephanie Rule. So this is a really, really important thing to talk about because when the restrictions get lifted, some people say it's going to be like a V economy. We're just going to snap right back. Well, we're not going to snap right back. Surely we want to get back to our regular lives, but things are going to change. These social distancing rules aren't going to just change overnight. Think about what it's going to do to the restaurant industry. We've got millions of restaurants in this country, millions of people who work directly in the restaurant or the food service business. When we come back, many restaurants are going to have to cut their capacity in half to respect the social distancing rules. Think about bars, think about movies, any business where there's high touch, fitness trainers, hairstylists, there are so many businesses where you're in close contact. So it's going to take us some time for us to get past this. And I know so many of us want to say, including the president, and you know, we completely get it. He wants to get America up and running again because that's what we do best. But if we open our businesses too soon, we could end up hurting ourselves from a health perspective, as well as economically. If we end up back out there too soon, we could get even sicker. Clearly, we all know the importance of practicing social distancing at this point, but we do recognize that that can take a real toll on your mental health. So what should you do if you start to feel isolated or even depressed? Dr. Christopher Cyrano from Adventist Health has a few suggestions. Um, you know, get outside. You can still go outside for a walk. Um, you know, it would be safe to do that. Um, you're not, you're not going to get it in the air. Um, to do art, um, you know, or other hobbies that you thought about. I think this is going to be a very contemplative time for, for us. You know, writing, I think there's going to be a lot of creativity that can be developed. Something we want to tell you about is tomorrow morning we're offering some help for those of you coping with stress. We're going to be teaming up with Lines for Life for a live conversation in the Reddit Ask Me Anything community. So join us tomorrow at 9 o'clock on Reddit tomorrow morning. So uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, we'll be bringing you a special edition of Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. One of her guests is giving us kind of a better idea of the impact that the coronavirus pandemic is having on rural areas in Oregon. KGW is committed to continuing coverage on this coronavirus outbreak. If you still have questions, which I know you do, our past stories may answer a few of them for you. So go to kgw.com slash facts, not fear. Homeowners, are you?